ongoing and going on around the world. We'll park the T20 Women's so because we're going to discuss that separately tomorrow. First up, Dawley, though. Um, you're there, uh, and was it Abu Dhabi? I always get confused between the two, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Um, but you, you're there for the ILT20. So let's deal with that to start with, shall we? Yeah, the ILT20, it's um, into its last week. So we just had the first of the qualifiers tonight. Uh, the winner went straight through to the final. It was actually the Desert Vipers, um, captained by Colin Munro, former Kiwi opening batter. Uh, he's done a pretty good job. Actually, his first season or first foray into captaincy of any um, decent team at any top level and uh, he's done a pretty good job he hasn't scored a lot of runs but he has captained his team well and they're through to the final on Sunday night so we find out uh, who they take on on Friday but tomorrow night um, it'll be Shane Bond and uh, James Franklin's team which includes Trent Bolt, uh, MI Emirates up against the uh, Dubai Capitals to see who goes through to the uh, Friday night's uh, eliminator Okay, all right, and, uh, and the quality of the cricket? Pretty good. Um, look, there's a few decent international stars. Obviously, with three tournaments, go, four tournaments basically going on around the world at the moment, you had the, the Big Bash, you've had the South African League going on, you've got the ILT20 where we are in Dubai and the Bangladesh Premier League. So the, the talent is spread a little bit thin. Um, it's, its aim is to grow the game a little bit more in the UAE. So two local players have to play every game. Um, I think that's a good thing. And you've got some decent international talent. Some some of the big stars, the Russells, the Pollards, um, you know, Narines, those sorts of guys. Chris Lynn's just arrived from Australia. James Vince, uh, Chris Jordan um, from from England. So there are some big international names uh, in and around the tournament. But uh, with four going on, you can understand that the, the talent is spread pretty thin across the world at the moment. Well, we've got England arriving, of course. Uh, they're here, and so that series starts next week. And then Australia versus India, which has got to be right up there, doesn't it? It's one of the premium test cricket series in the world. Yeah, behind the Ashes, I think the Border Gavask is probably the next one that people are interested in, um, more so when it's played in India, although um, India did have a great time of it with uh, Richard Punt and, you know, and the guys getting over the line in Australia the last time they were down there. So... Look, I've, I've seen a picture of the uh, of the surface that's uh, about to be used in Nagpur, Marty. I'm not sure whether you've seen it. If you haven't, I'll send it to you. It is the most bizarre-looking pitch I've ever seen in my life. What they've done is they've shaved completely all of the areas just outside the left-handers off stump. Remember, Australia have got six left-handers by the looks of it in their top seven. So they've shaved all the areas just outside the left-handers um, off stump for the spinners to bowl into, and then they've left the middle of the surface quite sort of green and grassy. So it's just the most bizarre looking surface you'll ever see. I'll get, I'll send you a photo to put up on the website if you haven't got one. Yeah, look, I mean, it just, I was told about this yesterday, and I was just trying to get my head around it and just think, I mean, look, it's home advantage, isn't it? You prepare the pitch for how you want it. But also, is that the first time in, oh, I don't know, so you'll know better than me, in such a long time that they actually, curators have actually given such a clear indication of the tactics of the teams involved? I, I think it is the first time in a long time, the clear tactics. I mean, normally you would say, okay, we're just going to leave it quite bereft of grass and, and, and it's going to turn. Um, and that's the case. But in this in this circumstance, there's actually grass in the middle and there's grass outside the right-handers off stump as well. But there's just nothing outside the left-handers off stump. So it's almost like um, a, a, a block, you know, a, a sort of a concrete block that's been taken off one side and then and left a little bit of it. It's just a really strange thing to look at. Uh, and I can understand why. And I've got no issue with home advantage either. I don't know whether this pitch is going to get a great rating from the match referee just because of the way it's looking, but I do not have a problem with home advantage. Okay, so Australia have tried 10 times since 1969. They've only won once. Why can't they win in India? Can't play spin, um, and, and that's the bottom line. They haven't been able to play spin well, and they've been quite uh, ignorant at times in just continuing to pick seam bowlers. And, you know, not only do you have to play spin well, you actually have to take decent spinners along. Uh, I can remember back to, I'm not sure what series it was, where Steve O'Keefe uh, took 11 wickets in a, in a test match. It might have been the last time in Australia were down, uh, were over in India. Um, and, you know, Steve O'Keefe, in all fairness, is, is an okay spinner. He's a decent spinner, but nothing great. They've got Nathan Lyon, of course. 
They'll use Ashton Agar as, as their left arm spinner, but the quality of spin that they're coming up against, India could pick any one of six, seven spinners. When you look at Jadeja, Akshar Patel, Ravi Chandran Ashwin, Yuzvendra Chahal, Kuldeep Yadav, um, you know, I've just named five without even worrying about it. They, they could pick any one of five, six, seven spinners. And, and still be very, very competitive. So that's the problem. Not only do you have to play spin well, you just it's relentless. It's like the Windies of the of the 80s, but in reverse. They just right. keep coming at you. Simon Dool is with us. We're just catching up on all the cricket, uh, the Devlin Dool podcast. Um, the Windies are playing Zimbabwe in a test series at the moment. Um, how much interest is there in this? Well, for those two teams, there's a lot of interest, um, and and I guess the the story is probably Tajnarain Chanderpaul, isn't it? The the I think um, there's only the second combination of father and son that have now got Test match double centuries to their name. That's nice, um, yeah. yeah, nice. And 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 Chanderpaul's hundred was the first Test match hundred for the West Indies by any other player not named Craig Brathwaite. Since Chris Gale, when yeah. you think about how long Chris Gale has been retired and away from the game, only Craig Brathwaite has scored a Test century opening the batting for the West Indies since Gale's retirement. And so, you know, really nice story. And 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 by all accounts, the the kid can really play. He's he's you know a chip off the old block and and is a serious serious player. So I think he'll be around for a long time. So that's a nice story. Um, and for Zimbabwe, Gary Balance. Um, you know, caught up in, in the Yorkshire um, scandal, the Yorkshire racism scandal with um, Azim Rafiq, decided to leave um, Yorkshire, leave England, go back to his place, place of birth, which is Zimbabwe, um, reels off a, a test match century um, for Zimbabwe. So uh, batting at number five or six. And I think he joins Kepler Vessels as the only the second ever player to score a test match century for, for two countries. Obviously, okay. England prior to that, and and now Zimbabwe. So, yeah, there's a couple of little storylines yeah. around it, Marty. And, and for the guys playing, it's, there's always there's always something for them. Oh, well, thanks for that. I mean, that does open the eyes a little bit. I was, uh, you know, reading quite a bit about that um, racism thing in Yorkshire, and then Matthew, um, uh, was it Matthew Hoggart, had decided just to uh, walk out of the investigation, I think, and just, it just sounds so messy, doesn't it? And it's that classic case of, you know, look, what goes on in a team dressing room you know, has to be taken in context at the time with those people. You know, you all of a sudden you shine a microscope on something that happened 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, you it's I just find it impossible, you know, and I don't understand how people do it. They can sit there and they can put their judgment yeah. on it today with what goes on today and then turn the clock back then. I mean, it's just, yeah, there is no easy answer to this. I'm not saying that it didn't happen no. or what went on was okay. But I'm just saying that the way that they're trying, it's almost like, an exorcism going on here. And it just is, it, to me, it's just not working and it's not the right way to do it. Look, uh, the world has changed. I mean, don't get me wrong. We all know that. And we all know that we have to be better. We all know we have to be, you know, be different and, and view things very differently nowadays. And what was said 20, 30 years ago is, is unacceptable. Um, I'm not saying it was right 20, 30 years ago, but it's just unacceptable now. And these things, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in, in a lot of ways there because if we go back retrospectively over our lives and start judging and and sentencing people for things that were done 25 years ago that were, were looked upon and and everybody thought oh well, that's you know that's that's just funny or that's not right or whatever and start judging them on today's standards then there'd be a lot more people um in trouble th than just a couple of cricketers or, or just a few cricketers around the world so it's a really delicate situation there's a lot more to come now i do understand and I, I know it's behind a paywall which is a bit of a sad thing but if you can get a hold of michael atherton's article from the times in the uk i think he's just written it overnight uh and published it now he's done a lot of talking a lot of digging a lot of um fact finding around this whole situation and i think it's quite a long read but I think it is very, very worthwhile, the, the Michael Atherton. He very rarely writes a bad piece, and, and I think it's worth a read. All right, finally then, we play England, of course. Just a couple of tests. How are you reading this? Uh, tough. I, I, look at the, I looked at the um, scorecard from, um, from the New Zealand A match. England are not going to play any differently to how they've been playing. They're going to play very, very aggressive cricket against New Zealand. Um, you know, if, if Jameson's fit, if he comes through this match, okay, then we might see him back in the New Zealand Test jersey, which 
it, it strengthens our bowling um, and strengthens it quite a lot. But they are going to put us under pressure um, with the bat in particular. We're going to have to be really, really good with the ball to contain it. Uh, and, you know, if we can't contain it, then the likes of, you know, our, our top batters, Latham, Williamson, Conway, are going to have to be incredibly good and put big numbers on the board. So it's a tough series. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting series. If I was in New Zealand, um, you know, I'd be encouraging people to go down and watch it because I think it's going to be a very exciting series, an entertaining series to watch. The way that England are playing cricket, it's, I would say it's revitalised test cricket because it hasn't entirely around the world, but it's certainly reinvigorated their test cricket and it's made people sit up and watch them play. And I think that's that's a good thing about it. So, yeah, if you get an opportunity, I'd say get down and watch it.